Welcome to Mental Health News Radio. I'm your host, Kristen Sunanta Walker. Just what are we going to discuss? The intimacy that is mental health. Let's continue to make it as comfortable as discussing brain health or heart health. This show has been on the air for several years and we have amazing co hosts. And then we created a network of podcasters on mentalhealthnewsradionetwork.com, a place where every possible facet of mental well being can be talked about openly. My show, after several hundred interviews, the format is this intimate, deep, funny, touching, sometimes uncomfortable, but always vulnerable conversations with interesting people. The goal is to have you, our listening family, many of you who have become my good friends, feel as though you are listening in on private conversations. Thank you for tuning in and becoming part of this amazing journey with me and now with our network of podcasters. Just knowing this podcast might be helping any of you realize you are not alone on this journey called being a human being makes doing this podcast worth every second. Hello, everyone. Kristen Walker here with Dr. Paul Meyer on our roundtable with Dr. Paul Meyer series. Paul, thanks so much for coming back on. It's uh, my delight, Kristen, especially (laughs) doing the programs with you. (laughs) Now, we're in the midst of a new... Um, topic of discussion, and I want you to explain where we're going with this one tonight. Okay, we're doing a whole long series. We don't know how many podcasts are going to be total. I listed uh, twelve, but we've already uh, this is this will be our second podcast on one of the twelve. <laughs> and we may, and I have a feeling that this will stretch out into one or two more probably, but eventually. But we're going to uh, devote a whole bunch of of uh, podcasts uh, in a row, and I'm sure you'll want some breaks. Uh, in between with other topics, but on personality and its development and, and how we can change and things like that. In the the last podcast we did, Kristen, um, uh, you and I discussed uh, how the first six years of life, well, basically, that about half of our person, according to psychiatry research, about half of our personality is formed in the first three years, uh, but that we can change no matter how old we are, our basic way of looking at life, and about uh, 85% of our sixth birthday. And uh, during those years, it strongly affects our views of men, women, ourselves, um, our self-talk, uh, what marriage is like and what God's like and friends and all those sorts of things. We discussed uh, uh, a whole bunch of those things uh, in our previous podcast. But tonight, what we're going to focus on, depending on how much time we, uh, <laughs> how much we cover in an hour or less, our self-concept and, uh, in, in, you know, first, and then if we still have time, after discussing self-concept, um, uh, I've, I've got a bunch of uh, research that I did way back when I was at Duke University Medical School in psychiatry residency back in the mid-70s. Mm-hmm. I, I researched um, for part of my duties there. I did research on personality development, and, uh, and I wrote my very first book on it, on personality development back uh, it was published in 1977, but I was doing the research in 74 and 75, and it's based on 436 research articles. It doesn't mean they're right, but at least you know it's based on pretty good research. And and uh, and so when as we have time, either this podcast or the next, we're going to talk about with tongue in cheek, hmm. instead of saying you know these factors produce this kind of problem and stuff like that to make it more interesting, we're going to talk about how. You could take uh, 10 kids and uh, have 10 brand new babies. And by learning the thing, the things in this, these research articles, how to turn one of them into a social introvert, one of them into a passive aggressive personality Hmm. disorder, how to turn one of them into an alcoholic or drug addict, how to turn one of them into a borderline personality disorder and another one into a narcissist, another one into a sociopathic criminal, another one into a histrionic uh, personality. Another one into an obsessive compulsive personality words to excess. Uh, another one into an eating disorder and, uh, and another one into a, a, a paranoid personality. Hmm. And, you know, maybe someday, well, actually all the rest of the podcasts are on how to produce healthy 
<laughs> no. <laughs> so this but, is a. But we're not wanting anybody. Not we're not wanting anybody. To, yeah, we're not wanting anybody to produce those things. But uh, but I summarized. Uh, uh, I did it that way to make it more interesting. Um, where if you look at how to take an innocent brand new baby and turn that brand new baby into um, a, a you know a narcissist or you know a paranoid personality or things like that, then then it helps us not to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's really my goal, but to do it in an interesting way. So let's, uh, you know what, we start with uh, self-concept and things that influence it in the first six years. Now, I'll just kick it off and then you and I are going to discuss, um, let's see, we've got 10 things that affect self-concept. We'll see how many of those we get to. We may not even get to the other things yet, but I, I believe self-concept is really, really, really important. You know, the rest of our lives, it, our view of ourselves is really important. It needs to be accurate. It doesn't need, need to be all positive, but it needs to be accurate and not, uh, uh, not uh, all negative uh, either. But um, as, as humans, we feel a lot of, we can feel emotional pain sometimes from non-emotional sources like, you know, genes or, uh, low, you know, being real low in certain vitamins or having a uh, low thyroid or even uh, um, uh, a lot of my patients that are doing great need to get on uh, steroids for a while for asthma or things like that. And the steroids uh, can even make them have depression and low self-concept temporarily, things like that. We're not going to go into those. But the most common causes of low, of emotional pain in life, I believe, are one is lack of self-worth. So that's why self-concept is so important. Self-concept is the same as self-worth. A lack of a healthy self-concept, I think, is one of the main sources of emotional pain. And then a second one is lack of intimacy with others because um, no man is an island, no man stands alone. There's a song like that, you know? Remember that? Mm-hmm. And uh, But uh, we all need to love and be loved by people who know the truth about us, people who know us as we are. So lack of intimacy with others is uh, vitally important. And then uh, I also believe, and you know, a lot of our listeners may disagree with me, but I really believe that um, a big part of our um, um, emotional joy in life comes from intimacy with God, who is truly our higher power. And lack of intimacy with God or having no God in our lives, I think can be a big detriment to our uh, self-esteem too, but you know, uh, people have a right to disagree with me on that. <laughs> you know, I've got my my own views. Some do. So, uh, <laughs> why don't you and I start start going down this? Uh, sure. Uh, list. What, you want to take the first one? And... Absolutely. So you have okay uh, sources of positive self-concept and self-worth in the first six years yeah. of life can include deep affection from parents. So that would be touching, holding, breastfeeding, or holding the baby while feeding from a bottle soft words or even songs while in the womb or during the first six years. Yeah. So uh, feeling the affection of our parents is, is a really strong influence on our self-esteem because if they love us, we can feel that. And that helps us to, to feel, feel valued and feel lovable and to love ourselves more. Right. Another one is pot is similar. It's positive. The first one's more, touch, feel, singing, mm-hmm. um, you know, and all Attention. those sorts of things. But yeah, the, the second one is positive regard. I, I believe a, a child can, and I don't know how young it is. You're a mom. I'm not. So uh, you tell me how young you think your kids could tell, but how young do you think your kids were when they could look in your eyes and by looking in your eyes, they could tell whether you were feeling positive thoughts toward the child or, or uh, giving them positive regard or looking at them with uh, scorn, disregard and anger over, you know, crapping in their pants again, or, <laughs> <laughs> or if, you know, when, when you have a little boy, you know, it's, it's even worse right. when you have a little boy and you take off his diaper and he pees in your face or something, you know, right. Exactly. I, I think <laughs> but, the, the mom, uh, yeah, how, how young? How young do you think? Oh my gosh! I mean, in the womb and immediately after they're born, they can tell. Uh, absolutely, I, that was my experience with my own child. And um, uh, you know, there are certainly plenty of studies that talk about this 
the feeling that they can get from just being in the womb still. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. If, if, uh, and even if they, if they hear the parents yelling at each other and things mm-hmm. like that, that makes them feel more uncomfortable. Um, but when, you know, when they, as the older they get, um, in, in those first six years, um, the more they can look in your eyes and by experience know whether you're valuing him or her, uh, or whether you're devaluing, uh, him or her, or even being disgusted by him or her. And, and when you're young, you believe your parents are right. Right. You know, you and I have talked about that lots of times, you know, cause, um, uh, you know, about the effect that abuse has on a child is so powerful because, an abused child thinks that they deserve it. Absolutely. And I think about uh, number three, which is around attention, giving the child your attention. And what's interesting is we have what's now called the iGen generation, the first generation of kids that were born into social media, smartphone, you know, uh, technology the way that it is today. And everyone. How, how do you spell that? Uh, How do you spell that? The I-gen, letter, is that? Yeah, the letter I and I. then G E N. G E N? Mm hmm. Okay. So the so, I generation. Yep, exactly. Oh, because oh, the I stands for information generation or. Uh, internet. Or it, it has many, you know. Oh, um, yeah. Okay. Information, yeah. internet, all those. Yeah. Exactly. Kind of like. So, go, go ahead. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead and explain <laughs> that because this is a, that's well, not what, a term I'm. You, you mentioned it to me with? before, but I, but I haven't. It's, it's way after my generation, you know, <laughs> tell me about that. Tell well, about what's, what's interesting is, you know, it's that it's the first generation that, uh, like I said, was born into this new age, this new digital age. And so when we look at how many parents are looking at a phone instead of looking at their child, looking at a computer instead of looking at your child. Now we've seen that in, you know, the millennial generation, we've seen that in other generations, but this is the first one that was born into this, this generation that we have now. So, you know, what are they, what messages are they getting that immediately out of the womb, they're competing with some kind of device, you know, where their their parents are buried in this device and where they're taught to to bury themselves in in a device of some kind rather than get that warm attention from a human being. Yeah. You know, actually I, I say I'm too old to recognize that. Uh, but one of my, uh, one of my sons told me not, not long ago and he's in his forties that, um, you know, that he remembered, uh, uh, he remembered, uh, when he was a kid in his first six years and, and I was playing, uh, you know, we didn't have, we didn't have computer games back then, but, but I think I had, uh, uh, I forgot what you call those things, you know, with the sticks and all that stuff. You know, we did have those games and, uh, and, and I'd spent a lot of time cause that was new. And I spent a lot of time playing games, um, on those, uh, you know, apparatuses and, and he felt like sometimes I, uh, ignored him because I was playing games and, 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 uh, I would say, you know, well, you know, as soon as I'm done with this, with this game, I'll come out and talk to you and things like that. Right. But when, uh, when, when a child, uh, like my son, when a child comes up, says, dad, I got something real important to share with you. And you say, not now, not now. And you push him away and say, you know, catch me later or I'll come, I'll, you know, I'll come get you later. Unless it's going to be, you know, I'll see you in one minute or something like that. But then, uh, in psychiatry, those are actually called don't exist messages. Exactly. And so a child can actually feel like he's being told by the parents not to exist. And right. it can, it, you know, not that, you know, when, when a child, you know, a lot of kids commit suicide and they have great parents and I don't want to lay a guilt trip on anybody. Um, but if we give a child a lot of those don't exist messages, it, it can make it, you know, uh, more likely to happen. It doesn't, it doesn't, you can't cause anyone to commit suicide. Um, and, uh, and some kids, a lot of, an awful lot of uh, kids or teenagers who do commit suicide. And it's one of the leading causes of death in teenagers. It's a lot higher in teenagers than, than it is in adults. And it's 300% higher 
in teenagers now than it was 50 yes. years ago. Yes. You know, so there, so our culture, like you said, our culture is getting less intimate and more of all these other things. And, and, uh, but, um, a lot of times a child uh, or a teenager will get clinically depressed either genetically or because of circumstances or because of lack of self-concept, lack of intimacy with others, lack of intimacy with God. And if their chemicals get out of whack, then suicide becomes logical. Yes. And if they just, you know, if they just got some counseling and got on antidepressant medicine, you know, we can take anybody like that and, and get them to feel really quite good within about four or five weeks, you know, with intensive counseling or, you know, a few months with, uh, you know, uh, beds and counseling that takes a little longer. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of people, in other words, commit suicide just because their chemicals are, are messed up. Right. And and what we don't have, we don't have treatment protocols for kids that are growing up today. And these kids in the iGen generation, which are as of right now in, you know, June of 2019, that would be anyone that is 21 years or younger. So some of these young adults are going to start having children now and they are addicted to different types of technology screen time and so how are they going to nurture and give that you know real human yeah. contact with their child when they yeah. possibly their babysitter as a child themselves was some form of technology so they don't yeah. have a role model for that and um, so they're raising children and their children are grasping for that kind of tactile, um, you know, stare in your eyes, sing songs yeah. and time attention, but they're all buried in some kind of screen. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, I, I see. Um, I, I'm, I'm slowing down now that I'm 74 years old. Mm-hmm. Not much. I, you know, I went from. 60 hours a week down to 50, you know, I'm slowing down. <laughs> right. That's not really slowing down. Next year, 40 and the, you know, right. when I'm 90, I'll, I'll be down to maybe 30 hours. Or like that. <laughs> but I would die if I, if I just quit working, I would just, I'd sit on my butt and die, you know. Right. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but when I see, uh, I, was, I started to say, um, so now I, uh, the only new people I see are right now are people in their 20s that were ADHD is their primary diagnosis. That's because, mm-hmm they're fun and easy to take care of, you know, and, and I let all my other psychiatrists take care of all the tough ones. But, but when I do see somebody in their early twenties, like you said, you know, 21 and under, uh, sometimes they'll sit there on the very first session, you know, we spend an hour together and they're sitting there with their, looking at their phone while I talk to them. Mm-hmm. And when mm-hmm. I mention serotonin or something like that, you know, they're looking it up and reading about it as I talk. And, yes. and as I talk to them, they're looking up one word after another, and once in a while, I'll look up and have eye contact with me, but it's right. bizarre to me. Yes. You know, it seems bizarre. Yep. So, yeah. Okay, well, we mentioned don't exist messages, um, and, and, and I've been guilty of giving those to my children. It's the last thing in the world I, I wanted to do, but yeah. And then um, um, and another factor, uh, number five on our list here, uh, Kristen, is that, you know, in the first six years of life, when we're forming 85% of our self-concept you know we really uh we really are inferior right you know we really are inferior we're inferior in size mm-hmm. compared to everybody else uh we're a lot more clumsy so we're not nearly as coordinated as everybody else we're we think more concretely uh you know everything's black or white in the way we look at th- things and and uh most children don't really become abstract thinkers until they're about 11 and some people never do uh but a concrete like an example would be uh people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones mm-hmm. well to somebody under 11 that means if you live in a house that's made out of glass right. you shouldn't throw stones because it might break the windows you know right. but exactly. when you're 11 or older if you have abstract thinking you realize that means if you have faults you shouldn't be uh you know going around blaming other people for having them because you know if you live in a glass house yourself you shouldn't be throwing stones because you'll break your own image you know so uh but anyway they they have concrete thinking they misinterpret so many things right because they haven't had experience and they're inferior in authority not only are their parents bossing them around uh 
but even their older brothers and siblings, uh, brothers and sisters and uh, any other large person around them is bossing them around. So they're inferior. They genuinely are inferior. So it's, it's not surprising that we develop uh, inferiority feelings uh, when we grow up in those, when so much of our personality is formed by age six and, uh, and we truly are inferior in those first six years in, in a lot of ways. Right. And the word misinterpretation is interesting to me, too, because of that instantaneous access to, like you talked about, your patients that will sit there and they'll be looking up things that you're saying to them. Mm -hmm. The development of a, of a younger person's brain, at, you know, before certain ages and that access to so much information filtered through the developmental stage of someone who is much younger and yet they have access to everything yeah, so much true. is available for misinterpretation yeah and i mean little kids you know young kids today a lot of them uh have ipads and, yep and uh uh even um but my, uh, uh, let's see, he just turned nine. My nine-year-old nephew got a, uh, an iPhone. A lot of kids have them a lot younger than that. But, you know, got an iPhone. And, and my uh, six-year-old niece has an iPad um, already. And, and uh, I mean, um, I mean, a lot of that's good. I'm not saying it's bad. Right, right. It, it, it really is neat that they, they can learn so much. You know, when I was a kid, I remember being, you know, five or about four or five years old and I got or six because I could read I must have been six um because uh, I got interested in ants we had ants in our yard and <laughs> and so I back then we had encyclopedias so I pulled out an encyclopedia and, and there was about 12 pages on ants and I read all 12 pages and it was so fascinating and I still remember it uh today you know uh nowadays they can look at you know push uh the word ant on their uh google and they have pictures and uh, right. of all different kinds and such great illustrations and everything. And so a lot of that's good, you know. But um, but like you said, we can get overwhelmed by it and things like that. Uh, as we're developing, um, uh, well, let's see. We're going to get to worldview. Let's get, let's wait and put that off. Okay. Um, and then um, another another factor, the sixth a sixth factor that influences our self-concept is uh, negative influences that we can get. And education is good. Church is good. You know, I, I don't want to give the wrong impression. In fact, um, there was a study, um, one of the studies that I read, Kristen, is, was a study done by 13 different psychologists and psychiatrists from different universities that did thorough questioning of 90,000 teenagers. Wow. And they hired people to, to do it. They didn't do it all, just those 13 people. But they, they interviewed 90,000 teenagers about a lot of their, uh, you know, they, they had a, a list of, uh, I forgot how many questions, like 30 or 40. Uh, and they met with them privately. The people that did it met with them privately to ask them and things like that. And uh, they were amazed by a lot of things they found out, like uh, something like uh, among the among these teenagers, one out of, and, and I, I don't have the article in front of me, but it, but it was something like one out of every 30 or 28 girls, teenage girls, had uh, um, um, contemplated suicide seriously in the previous 12 months. <coughs> and, uh, and one out of like 40 boys had. Mm -hmm. And girls attempted a lot more than boys, but a lot more boys die of it because they're more, um, you know, they use more physical means like guns and things. And, uh, uh, but, one thing that they found was that kids that belong that went to church and belonged to a church youth group. It doesn't matter. I'm not talking about uh, Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, uh, Muslim. I'm not talking about any single denomination, but kids that had a, a religious, uh, a healthy religious interaction with other kids and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and teenagers who prayed and things like that actually had a, a much a higher self-concept than kids that didn't, and they had a much lower suicide rate. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it, it it can be helpful. But but in the first six years of life, uh, even in in churches, religious education, it can be negativistic instead of positive. 
depending on, you know, where the source, you know, what the source is. And uh, uh, kids uh, have uh, inferiority feelings anyway as they're growing up, and then they go off to preschool and then kindergarten and then first grade and all that's before age six. You know, first grade, I guess, you know, you're halfway through it by right. the time you, or no, I don't guess you turn seven until the end of first grade. But they go off to school and they start getting tests on different subjects. And you know what? Uh, as kids, we might get a 90% on a test and that might even be an A, you know, and, and, uh, but instead of really feeling proud of it, um, the, the way our teachers are taught to do it is, is wrong. They, they put red marks on the things you got wrong. And so you look at that test and all you see are the, the 10% marks. that you got wrong in red right. marks. You know, it, if it, it'd be really good if teachers took the time and put, um, you know, like, blue marks by all the things you got right, right. you know <laughs> and and, uh, and and so you felt better about uh getting a 90 percent feeling instead mm -hmm. of feeling bad about the 10 percent that you missed but um and negative uh teachers critical teachers i had a really nice kindergarten teacher Kristen, but my first grade teacher um was mean and uh in uh one time the guy next to me you know i think we, the whole class was standing i think we were singing a song or something and and uh the guy next to me you know whispered something to me and i whispered something back you know we were staying back in the room she came back and 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 our hit our heads together oh my god i mean it wasn't soft either and she ended up getting fired for that but and she should have but you know so there's some teachers that are real critical and, and mean and stuff so there can be negative influences in education accidental and on purpose but right. again you know doesn't mean we shouldn't get education because it can be positive too. Um, so anyway, that's number six. And then seven um, is praise is good and valuable, but even praise can damage your your kid's self esteem. And this may surprise people. Right. Like, uh, you know, if if uh, if you have uh, if you have a, a little girl, especially in our culture, maybe not so much now as it used to be, but if you have a little, a brand new infant girl who's growing up, she becomes two and three and four and five. It's real common, or it used to be uh, real common for the parents to, uh, that are even trying to be good, positive parents to constantly praise that little girl for how pretty she is. Yes. Oh, how pretty you are. How lovely you look. What a beautiful girl. And you know, I hear people doing that all the time still. Oh, what a beautiful girl. And, uh, and what is that? teach a right. girl it sounds innocent but what is it and i think it's okay to do that once in a while but if if you hear that repeatedly you know what does that teach you about what your value is based on yes absolutely you know, physical appearance rather than and, and it's a lot more important or, or a guy on being a a real stud you know uh, uh somebody that's a um uh, i don't mean a stud sexually but uh a, a real you know masculine strong athletic right. uh, boy again it's there's nothing yeah. wrong with them working hard to get good at a sport and getting praised for it and things. But, but uh, there, there's, there's families where the dad was a, a jock, a real athlete, and he might have two sons and, and one's real athletic like dad. And another one might be really gifted by God in art and music and things like that, you know, and, uh, um, and they both deserve being praised, you know, and, uh, um, you know, the kids need to grow up and develop the things that are their natural inclination, God-given inclinations, and not forced into a mold uh, uh, by the parents. And, and we need to not praise little girls too much for their looks. We yes. need what we need to praise our kids for is character. Exactly. For, oh, that was yeah, uh, and not just even saying you're a good girl or you're a good boy, but uh, specific things that they did. Hey, you just you know, uh, yeah, your your little sister. Um, you know, was crying because she couldn't find such and such a toy. And you went in the other room and looked for it and found it and brought it to her. What a wonderful thing for you to do. Right. That is so, I am so impressed by that, you know, or, or praising them, you know, for other things that have to do with character. Even if they steal a cookie out of the cookie jar and come back and feel guilty later and confess it to you. That's wonderful. See, I'm so proud of you for admitting that because we all make mistakes. Right. You know, but not all people admit it. So. 
Right. There's so much around, around looks. It's, it's interesting. I, I had a friend that, um, no matter what was going on, I mean, their child could be, uh, you know, smoking marijuana from sun up to sundown since the, you know, the time they were an early teen up until, you know, 17, 18 years old. At, but nothing, you know, no matter what was going on, the way that they were praised was, oh, he's so handsome. My, my son is so handsome. And I thought, yeah. what on earth are we... <laughs> you know, why is this of value? And this is now praised on social media as well. And their son or daughter is on social media too. So they're seeing their parent praise them for their looks on social media while they know that they're addicted to, you know, substances and things are getting swept under the rug and not really dealt with, but their praise that they're getting outwardly through social media is on what they look like. Yeah. And, and we don't even determine our looks, you know, we're either born looking better than average or worse than average or average. And, um, you know, uh, it, so we're being praised for something that we really had not much to do with. Um, and, uh, but if you praise character, then people will base their self worth yes. on being good people. Yes, exactly. And that's really important. So, okay, so uh, let's get, now this is our, uh, one of the most interesting ones to me, and I'm glad we had time to get to this. I doubt if we'll get into how to produce a passive aggressive and a <laughs> alcoholic and a borderline personality and all those things. I thought we would, but you know, the, the best laid plans of mice and men are often laid to waste. I forgot what poet said that, but uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, number eight is our worldview. The worldview, the worldview that a, a newborn baby has is that they are the world. <laughs> right, right. What's that? We are the world. You know, that, there used to be a really good song about that. Right. Uh, um, you know, that, that was a healthy view of it. But the, the baby thinks that they are the world. And, um, and then uh, usually when they're about seven months old, uh, for those of you listening in our listening family right now, if you have little, little kids, if you think that, that your little four-month-old is cute, uh, and I'm not talking about, physically beautiful but just i mean adorable you know emotionally and in every other way uh wait till he or she turns seven months old because at seven you know when they're four months old they'll smile back at you um Mm -hmm. and you think it means a lot more than it does but they'd smile back at a teddy bear that was smiling too but when they're seven months old um then they uh have a lot more recognition of individuals and and uh, when they're smiling at you, it's because they're smiling at grandma or grandpa because they know a lot more about what they're like and or at mom or dad or things like that. So they have more uh, recognition. And uh, but they still feel like their mother is, uh, according to research anyway, you know, some of this is just guessing, but according to psychiatry research, um, kids think that their mother is an extension of them to some extent until they're about 18 months old. That, and that's why uh, an infant, when the mom leaves the room, did you know how many infants will start crying? Right. Because they, 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 according to psychological theory, anyway, anyway they, they say it's because they feel like part of them left the room. Right. But at about 18 months, a lot, of, a lot of infants get over that because when mom leaves the room, they realize that all of them are still in that room. You know, part of them didn't leave the room. It's just mom that left and she'll be back. Um, so... Uh, um, and then, so the older we get, then we get a little older and, and the world, so the world becomes me and my mom and then the world becomes me and my family and then the world becomes our whole home and then it becomes our, uh, our yard and our neighborhood and, right. and then our school and, and then our city and then our state and, and, uh, and then our country and, uh, hopefully we mature to a point where, uh, we meet people of all different cultures and, uh, if we do get to travel, it's really a, a blessing. Yes. Uh, I've been blessed. Not, uh, you know, we were too poor to travel when I was growing up, but uh, as an adult, I've been able to go all around the world uh, teaching um, psychiatric things to, to people and because of the books and all that. And, and now here, you and I right now, Kristen, uh, people have downloaded these podcasts from all about 170 countries. Yep. Yep. Something like that. Yeah. 170 nations. 
And so uh, we are talking to the world right now, and it's really neat. So we have a more worldly view in a healthy sense of, of our world. Our world now is people all over the world, and, and, uh, and we even talk about things like, like uh, heaven and afterlife and things like that. That becomes part of our worldview. So our worldview matures as we mature, uh, but babies uh, in those first six years of life have a very limited uh, worldview. Yes, and one of the benefits of our digital age is that we, you know, at younger and younger ages, we do have access to the entire world through the technology that we're using. So you don't necessarily have to travel to find out these things. They're available right at your fingertips. So that's 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 an advantage. Yeah, and all the videos and stuff that are online. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of advantages to all these new things too. Because, you know, like, you know, in the past, if if I looked up the word ant, you know, I had to read about it and there might be a couple of pictures, but now you can see, uh, you, know, you know, you can Google it and, and uh, see, you know, videos of the ants doing what they do and things. From all over the planet. Just as one little example. Yeah. Right. Then I don't want to um, make single parents. There's a lot of single parents running around um, and uh, a lot of kids growing up with single parents. And, 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 and you can produce good kids, uh, even if you're a single parent. And so I want to encourage you, not discourage you, but it is, it is tougher. And so you have to work a little harder at it. And, uh, 80 per, 82% of, uh, single parent families are led by a female and, uh, 18% by a male. Um, and, uh, children can survive, uh, but it takes more effort. Uh, as the kids are growing up, they, we copy our moms and dads and, it's nice to have both there to, to learn character from and, right. and things like that. Um, and we do a lot of that from two to six. And uh, so in, in uh, uh, you know, I, I hear, sometimes I'll hear parents um, say, well, I taught my kid not to smoke. Uh, and I say, oh, that's good. Do you smoke? Yeah, I smoke a pack a day. You know, <laughs> I taught right. my kids not to drink. And, well, do you drink? Well, yeah, I drink a fifth of whiskey a night, but, but they don't. I told them not to, you know. So uh you know i uh, uh children learn a lot more from what we do than from what we say yeah, so right. if, if if you are a single parent it's nice to get an uncle or an aunt or uh, somebody that's the opposite sex from whatever you are to have an influence on the child too so they learn how to identify with you know men and women and and not just all the same sex or the, all the same anything and uh, so that, that's important too Absolutely. So yeah, the ten, the ten, ten, one, ten yeah. Yeah, yeah, common effects of birth order, which I always find this fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I was a, I was first born and I'm an only child. So, <laughs> but well, what, okay. Now what, what do you think, uh, what, what do you think, uh, what, what, what do you think are the advantages and disadvantages of being an only child since you are one? Oh my gosh. I have no idea. I mean, I, I really don't know. I do not know what advantages and disadvantages. I guess disadvantages are, I, I don't know advantages, but I know disadvantages. And I saw this really not from my own, but from watching my son. He would, uh, because I had a ton of cousins to hang around with and my cousins had siblings. And so I could watch the fighting and the, you know, learning how to negotiate and how to, you know, have grievances and work them out. I could see that by watching my cousins and my son did not have that kind of an experience. He was much more isolated than I was. So he would go to a friend's house and watch siblings fight and come home and just be indignant about how horrendous it was. And I would just kind of laugh because I was like, well, you have no idea what you're talking about um, because you're an only child. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. It wasn't until he got remember, into the military where I said, Oh my gosh, he's learning now at, at a much older age how to, you know, have these interactions with other people his own age that he didn't learn by having siblings. So it, it was fascinating yeah. to watch that. So an only child would get more attention, mm-hmm. you know, and that could be, depending on parents, that could be good, you know, positive right. attention. One, I think one negative thing, uh, one disadvantage of being an only child is um, when parents haven't had any kids yet, they don't know what to expect. 
Right. And the natural tendency is for parents to expect way too much. Right. And so the first child um, will have, you know, all the expectations uh, of, of parents put on one person. Right. And, uh, and, and, and dad, dad may have grown up where he wasn't very good at sports. He liked sports. Like I, I love sports, but I was never really very good at it. I was a really good goalie, but, but I'm not that coordinated. So I, you know, I, you know, I, uh, played on a fraternity basketball team, but I warmed the bench up and played on a baseball team. And I don't think I got into a game and, uh, you know, <laughs> and so I love sports, but they don't love me. You know, I, I, I tried golf and even got lessons by some pro, you know, I, I actually, um, golf pros. I wrote a book with Gary player, the hall of fame golfer and, uh, and with Jim Hiskey, a pro golfer and, on you know, positive things we can learn and stuff from, from sports. And, uh, so a sports psychology book, but Jim Hiskey even tried to give me lessons and he gave up on me, uh, <laughs> cause I'm so bad at sports. So I love sports, but I wasn't good at it. And so it'd be easy for me to push my kids to excel at sports. And I think maybe I did to some extent. I mean, I tried not to do these things that I wrote about in my book before I had kids, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but it'd be, it'd be easy to do that. So the firstborn, you know, maybe the mom didn't get to, um, be in a beauty contest and dad didn't get to be the star athlete or, or, or mom wanted to be a musician, but they couldn't afford an instrument or different things. And so whatever we weren't good at, we're trying to get our little, uh, only child to be good at too. Right. So the expectations of the parents are, are uh, put on the, the only child. Um, so it has advantages and disadvantages, but you know, I, I've seen only children turn out really healthy and some that didn't turn out really healthy. So I'm not sure if it's, you know, such a big disadvantage, but it's probably somewhat of a disadvantage. I would think, I, I think it'd be better. It'd be easier to grow up with at least one sibling, you know, to interact with and grow up with and things like that. I think and I, and I know to... ideally, Oh, go ahead. I, I think you learn how to negotiate uh, relationships a, a little bit better when you have siblings. Um, you yeah. don't you don't get so upset or surprised at uh, or really that self esteem hit of uh, a little bit of bullying, things like that. You yeah. can you can tolerate it, not that you want anyone to have to tolerate it, but you can tolerate some of those behaviors that happen on the schoolyard a bit yeah. better when you've had that, you know, sibling relationship that's yeah. going on in your home. Whereas an only child yeah. is kind of like, oh, you know, what is this? They don't know how to handle it. They don't have anyone. They work through that at home. You know, that can be, that can be really a big surprise. Yeah. If you don't have siblings. And I don't think they're, I don't think there's an ideal number of uh, kids that you can have, but I know uh, uh, some of the statistics that, that that were in those articles were that the ideal seemed to be to have kids be about three years apart Right. for some reason. I don't even know why, but if they're about three years apart, that's good. And, and um, uh, the, uh, the birth order, let, let's say a little bit about that because, you know, we still have time to do that. Like I said, when you don't have kids, you don't know what to expect. And, uh, and, um, and so we tend to expect too much. And we especially do that. Uh, we all have, we all have flaws. Uh, you know, Kristen, we've talked a lot in our podcast about maybe 80, you know, 70 or 80% of our thoughts, feelings, and motives we're not even aware of. Right. Like, uh, you know, I'm wearing a, a blue, plaid shirt today and, uh, and you know when i picked it out i just sort of grabbed it in the closet but there's probably a whole bunch of reasons why i picked it out that i'm not even aware of you know if you look around those of you in our listening family look around the room that you're in um and look at like the pictures that you have hanging on the wall why did you pick those out well you probably have some conscious reasons but you have me a lot more unconscious reasons than conscious why did you if you're married why did you pick the person that you married uh, most of the time, not always, but most of the time it's because if you're a, a, a female, then whatever your dad was like, you're going to be naturally attracted to people like your dad. Cause that's what you learn. Men are like, and dads are like, 
So even if your dad was physically or sexually abusive or, or just, you know, really mean or really nice, you're going to tend to uh, be attracted to men like that. And, and uh, if you were abused growing up, then you tend to feel like you deserve it anyway. So anyway, as parents, we have a lot of flaws that we don't see in ourselves. And so when the first child comes along, we expect too much out of that child. You take more pictures of the first one than you do all the rest of them put <laughs> together. So you're proud of that child too, you know, but in, in, uh, in, Dads uh, tend to be, in, you know, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, dads tend to be toughest on the oldest boy, even if he's the second or third child, but the first boy. And moms tend to be toughest on the oldest girl, right. even if it's the second or third child. And the reason for that is because if we don't see our flaws, but then there's a child that comes along and walks like us and talks like us mm-hmm. and, and identifies with us in sexual you know, identity ways and things. Uh, and that, then that child will have our flaws and we'll get really mad at that child uh, for having flaws that we don't see in ourselves, but are so obvious in the child. Right. And that's seeing the molt in your brother's eye instead of the log in your own eye in biblical terms, but that's called projection. And uh, 15, listen to this statistic. We've mentioned it before, but Christian, 15 of the first American astronauts were first born sons. Right. Not only just the oldest boy in the family, they were the oldest child and male because, you know, they didn't pick females back then for astronauts. Now, now they've got female astronauts, too. And I've, I've met a couple of them uh, and interviewed one of them for a long time to help me with a project I was working on. But, um, so uh, the reason so many, 15 of the first 16 astronauts were firstborn sons is they had to be perfectionistic enough to make it to the moon and back. They had to be perfectionists. Absolutely. We're going to talk about how to produce the perfectionists later. But if you grow up where uh, no matter what you do, it's not quite good enough. If you get all A's and a B and your dad says, why'd you get that B? And it may be a loving dad that just grew up that way in that kind of culture, you know, uh, or, or you're uh, playing soccer. You're learning how to play soccer as a four-year-old or five-year-old. And, and, uh, and you might play a great game and score two goals. And, and maybe your dad, criticizes you for the one that you missed, right? you know, for the praising you for the two that you got. And uh, so the, 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 the firstborn or an only child gets that, or the oldest of each sex tends to get more of that lower self-esteem from feeling like no matter what they do, it's not quite good enough. Good enough. They, they're the most successful. They get the best grades. They're the most successful something like 80 or 85% of PhDs are, are uh, the oldest child of their sex. Uh, about 80% of MDs are. The pro athletes, a lot of them are. Um, so they succeed the most but enjoy it the least, usually. Mm-hmm. So they have a higher rate of depression because no matter what they do, it's not quite good enough. Uh, but they, they're very successful. So if they get a little therapy or listen to our podcast, <laughs> they can have both. <laughs> they can be successful and healthy perfectionists and enjoy it. You know, right, so. exactly. Uh, and it's easier to be a middle child. Uh, I was the third out of four and uh, the second boy. So I really got lucky. You know, <laughs> and uh, I, I just feel like it was a real blessing. And, in a, in a, you know, it's an unfair blessing that I got, but it was a blessing to be a middle child. And uh, lots of times the youngest child um, gets sort of spoiled. And, get away you know you're real strict on the oldest one and by the time the fourth or fifth kid comes along you, you sort of wore out and, <laughs> right. know, and the kid gets away with murder and and uh and boy have i have uh, i have very little patience for uh, often for the youngest child um just seen a lot of adults or experienced a lot of adults who were the youngest child and just emotionally immature and think, a lot, a lot more it's adorable. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah. A lot more yeah. become drug addicts and alcoholics. Right. You know, the the uh, younger children are a lot, a lot more likely to become drug addicts or alcoholics and uh, to not take responsibility and just sort of want to enjoy today and them mm-hmm. out. And, and, uh, and like everything that. they do is cute and interesting because they can get away with it yeah. because they were the youngest. Yeah. So, well, where do we pick up on this for next week, Paul? Well, I think that it's, you know, I think we've, you know, I, I think we ought to quit here. We could, I think we've talked for, I mean, we're, there's no number of minutes, uh, minutes that we need to do our podcast. And I think we've talked for about 50. 
Right. Uh, but I think I think it would be better to stop here than to go on. Right. But I want to arouse people's curiosity again so that you'll want to listen to the next one. Because the next one is uh, with tongue in cheek, mm. how to take uh, 10 healthy, uh, brand new spanking, spanking new babies and turn one into a introvert, one into a passive aggressive, one into a alcoholic, one into a borderline personality disorder, one into turn one into a narcissist, one into a sociopathic criminal, one into an overly emotional, histrionic, and dependent personality, how to turn one into an obsessive compulsive. We've already talked about how to produce an obsessive compulsive, uh, you know, today, but in how to turn one into an eating disorder, somebody with an eating disorder, and how to turn one into a, a paranoid personality. And, and uh, I'll, I'll just uh, give this one little hint, like if, you know, a lot of people listen, people listening to us today have pets and you and I have had quite a few pets and stuff. I, you know, I've got, we've got two little Yorkies in our house that I just adore and they adore us. And one follows me everywhere. Uh, and one follows, uh, uh, my wife everywhere and they just sleep with us at night and everything. And, and, uh, um, but what if you had a brand new puppy and you were nice to the puppy most of the time? But once or twice a day, you'd walk into the room that puppy was in and kick it across the floor. Just mm. give it a kick all the way across the floor. After a while, that puppy, if, if a, a really nice friend of yours came over, uh, that puppy would growl at the nice friend, you know, and be afraid of that friend and cower and growl or, um, you know, maybe even try to bite the friend or something because uh, the puppy would become paranoid. He would think, if I get kicked across the room, by my owner, then other people that walk in are going to kick me across the room too. And so see, that's how you can even produce a paranoid dog by, and so people that get uh, a lot of um, abuse, not necessarily physical, but get a lot of abuse, of course, are going to tend to think that, that uh, um, not always, but you know, a lot of times we'll think that everybody out there wants to hurt them. Right. And there are a lot of bad people out there that they do have to be careful of, but that's just an example. So next week we're going to talk about how to produce um, different kinds of disorders, not so that you will, but so that you'll recognize it and uh, understand yourself better right. and know how you can overcome those things that your parents taught you that are wrong. And also those of you who are raising kids will say, we'll see, oh man, I am doing this. Right. I don't want my child right. to become such and such, you know, so, I'm going to work on that. Absolutely. Okay. I'm excited to uh, get into this next week then, Paul. <laughs> yeah. It'll be fun. All right, listeners. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Roundtable with Dr. Paul Meyer on Mental Health News Radio. I know, I know, no one likes commercials, but seriously, folks, without the help from these organizations, we could not stay on the air. Please give a shout out to zencharts.com. If you're a mental health or addiction treatment center, you'll want to use their EHR. It's gorgeous. And they're just good people. And also my genetics, M-Y-G-E-N-E-T-X.com, because knowing your genetic code empowers your mental health treatment. And lastly, copenotes.com. We love getting positive messages right to our phones every day from Johnny Crowder. He's the lead singer of Prison, a heavy metal band sharing their music about suicide prevention, addiction recovery, and mental health. See, that was painless. Support them as they support us. Back to the show. Sometimes I'm passive aggressive, but never without good intentions. I heat up and act on my emotions. Thanks so much for listening to Mental Health News Radio. Our podcast can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, and hundreds of other podcast apps. Or you can visit our website at mentalhealthnewsradio.com. If you have a question or would like to be a guest, become a podcaster on our network, or join the amazing organizations that help keep us on the air, please email us at info at mhnrnetwork.com. Get ready for that special goodbye from our resident therapy dog, Miles, and a special thanks to Emily Sohn for letting us use her incredible song, Cordial, for our podcast music. Listen to the full song on SoundCloud at emily.sonne. Don't be surprised when I don't hate on you. After all we promised, we'd be cool.
Record.